Hello, hello, and welcome to the Fall for Watercolor Challenge Art Class Series. Today, we are going to be painting a leaf, a found leaf. Isn't it so pretty? Um, my daughter was so excited that she got to pick out today's subject. So without further ado, let's get into it. Um, so with this leaf, we are going to be talking about how to create a really realistic um, representation of that leaf. Um, and a lot of it is actually going to come down to the drawing. So I've already sketched mine out here below. I don't even know if you can you see that um, to save time because this is a painting instructional video. But if you don't have your drawing in a good spot, like it can be pretty hard to get the realistic piece because as you're following the shapes, um, you're gonna be like, wait, that doesn't line up. So one thing you can do with leaves, which is great, is you can trace it um, and that'll get the right size. Um, another thing you can do is take a picture of it, print the picture out, use it as a reference, place your paper up against like um, a window or a light box and just trace like the important elements. So the things that I would take note of are, um, let's see, I would take note of, oh, hi, Ana Luisa, no worries that you missed some days. All of the videos are um, recorded and still on YouTube and Facebook, so you can always access them. Um, so some things that I would note when looking at this are there, these little holes. Okay, we've got some little cracks. I would notice where the veins are and then these little spots like this part, this orangey part, I wouldn't draw that on your reference photo. I would. Um, and the reason for that is when you're working with pencil, whenever you paint over it, um, the pencil line is going to be there forever. And because we've got a nice soft blend, we don't really want to mark that line. Same thing goes for fur. I think a lot of times we want to mark like where the eyebrows and things like that are on dogs or whatever. Um, and my recommendation is to wait on that um, before you do and maybe add that in as a guideline later. But when you're doing your first layer, you don't want to cover over that line because then it's going to be stuck. Um, so we're looking at the big shapes, the things that can be covered by um paint okay um so let's go ahead and get into it um here my paper has some i think to be honest chocolate stains on it but we're gonna go ahead and use this piece of paper i'm gonna get a nice big brush because we're gonna be doing a wash first i have a clean cup of water so as we're looking at our leaf i am noticing a really nice bright yellow undertone that I think I can do pretty much for this whole leaf. Um, so I'm going to use my new gamboge. Um, and then I feel like the transparent yellow might just add a little bit of pop. And I'm going to, I'm just going to actually stick with that and create a nice juicy first layer. Um, and Yellow aspens is your favorite leaf. Oh, so pretty. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill in the entire shape, and I'm going to be really careful to make sure that I have enough water on here. So you can see how shiny it is. Do you see how there's almost like a puddle here? Um, that's okay because the water will stay within our water barrier because we've re we're using our arches paper. Um and I have mixed up a nice big paint puddle so I don't have to worry about running out. Um, I am painting over the parts where the cracks and stuff are because this yellow is very light and um, we'll add that detail in a little bit later. If you wanted to use masking fluid, you totally could. I am just choosing not to. Um, we always start with the lightest color with leaves. It is usually some form of yellow. Um, and as I'm pushing this paint across, I 
I'm evening out this layer. So we've got a lot of petal over there. I do want time to work on this, but I also don't want the paint to slosh around. When you're doing like a really realistic um, painting, I think the first layer can be a little like wet and wild. Um, but as you get more into the details, the drier you're going to be working. So um, the reason for that is we want more control over where the paint is going. And so we'll do that by um, not having it be as wet and just adding really slowly, really gently. Um, okay, so now I have my base layer. I'm going to add in some orange. Probably should have mixed up a little bit of that orange before I got started, but I I think I'm okay on time. But you might want to mix up any other colors you're going to use in the wet and wet. Um, and I'm going to just add a little bit here around the edges, okay? Just to slightly. And I really want this to look like where the leaf is. So for these under layers, and truly, I mean, you can get as granular as you want. Like if you are doing like, this is going to look like a stinking actual leaf, you might even want to go like a second layer of this paint um, to make sure that um, it's not blending too much, like it's going exactly where you want it to. So I'm just adding a little bit to kind of, this is a trick to kind of cut out the work in adding a second layer. So here I'm making sure that it's not going too far by just adding not a ton, like my brush is not very wet at all. It has more pigment, more paint, but not a ton of water. And that helps it from not like cascading all over my painting here. And so it's a little bit browner here on the leaves, edges. Um, okay, I'll bring this over so you can kind of see it. So just, this is giving me just a little bit of dimension here in this under layer. This is going to use a lot of layers and we're going to, we're going to go kind of, kind of quickly just because I have an appointment at 11. So we can't get here, stay here all day. Unfortunately, you know, I wish I could. Um, okay. So this middle section is like a little bit more orange. So I'm adding in some red, um, like a vermilion red to really brighten up that that middle part, you can see, oh, can you see the leaf? I'm so sorry. Here, let me back up a little bit so you can actually see the leaf that we're painting from. Um, so see how this is like a little bit more red? Um, and this is spreading in a way that actually doesn't look like how it does on the paper. So what I'm gonna do is after I've applied this paint here, I'm going to go back in with a clean paintbrush or a dry paintbrush. I'm going to coax the paint to be where I want it to be. So I'm using the brush. I've actually, do you see how flat that is? That's from like pushing my brush on my towel in the right way, like in the direction that I want it. And that gives me a really great shape to kind of be a little more specific on some of these edges. Okay, if you have any questions while we're going, please, please ask. Um, I am gonna pick up some of this paint here because it's pretty wet. Then I'm gonna add in a little bit of burnt umber here um, to get some of these darker areas. Now notice we're not doing those dark lines first. Those are gonna be some of the last steps, but I am including some of those little darker areas like kind of around here, just to give a base color so we're not building up from total scratch. Again, if we were doing like, this is going to be like photo realism, um, you'd be working a lot, lot slower, a lot, lot closer to the page. Like I probably wouldn't even be able to film it because my head would be like right there. Um, 
So we are going to capture the beauty and intricacies of this specific leaf um, in a realistic fashion, but we're not going for like hyper, hyper realism here. Okay, so here there is like this little tiny, almost like a burnt edge here on this leaf. And so I'm taking the very tip of my brush and going just around the edge of the leaf. And it is giving, oh, geez, it's too much paint. Um, it's giving this little kind of crispy edge there. And then by softening it with my brush, kind of pushing it back up against the edge, it's giving this really sharp line. Because if you look at this leaf, I don't know if you can see, like it's at the very, very tip. So, you know, I might do that in a second layer because I don't really want to mess with my under layer. So let's kind of put that on pause. We'll talk about that more. Yeah, add a little bit more burnt umber here. And sometimes it's like you think you're going to do one way and then the, the paint takes you in another direction. That's why when I'm talking through this, I'm kind of making decisions on the fly. Like I outlined this lesson, you know, I looked at this leaf and made a specific plan, but sometimes the water <laughs> has different plans for you. You know, um, it's just, <laughs> it's just the nature of watercolors. So we've got a little bit of this color along the veins. So I'm just lightly touching with my very dry brush. Right here, I'm using this silver black velvet brush. I really like this for large washes. I usually use this for like um, more um, loose painting, but I'm, I'm really liking it for this part of this painting here. So I'm lifting up a little bit of that color and I'm noticing it's pulling up a little bit more color than I want to right now. So I'm actually going to just stop. I think we're kind of at that point in the painting where it's gonna do like more harm than good. So same here, yep, you gotta just stop. See how it's pulling up too much paint? Um, sometimes you're, <laughs> you can tell the painting what to do, sometimes the painting is in charge of you. Oh, we've got some fall oak trees, sugar maple, Okay, so Tracy's asking, does water temperature matter at all? That is a really good question. I don't know that I know the answer to that. My guess, my hypothesis would be that hot water would make the paint flow more and colder water might help keep the water like, or the paint pigments from moving more because when the paints get hot, they do get kind of sticky and more... Um, like if I have dry paints and I leave them out in the sun, they will melt a little bit. Um, sometimes a binder that's used in watercolor paint is honey. Um, and so if you think about honey with heat, right, um, that can affect like the viscosity of the paint. Um, but I just use room temperature out of the tap. No filtered anything. Um, I think more like air temperature and um like sorry we're just waiting for this to dry um air temperature and humidity would make a really huge difference so like tracy <laughs> you and i are in washington so it's like gonna be really wet um in the winter like we our paints are gonna stay wet and like juicy for a long time. If you're painting in the, in Arizona, however, like your water's going to evaporate faster because there's not as much moisture in the air. So it's like, mm, yummy, let me get a little drink. Um, whereas here in Washington, our air is very saturated. So I would say like humidity in the air is probably going to make more of a difference than, okay, I thought it might still be wet down there, but it's not. Um, more of a difference than water temperature, but that's actually a really fun experiment that I kind of want to, I want to look at. So mm. coffee break. Okay. So now that we have our basic shape, I'm going to do a quick little blow dry to make sure that we are actually, let's just look at the stem. 
So I can kind of zoom in on this. The stem is dry. Whoop, hello. Um, we see like it's pretty solid coloration like right here. Um, but as we go down, we start to see like a little bit of the yellow on the side. And then down here, we've almost got a little bit of green and a little bit of a shiny line. So as we're working with these teeny tiny shapes, I'm using a size zero brush. This is the um, Princeton Real Value Art Brush. It is um, a round brush. This is actually what comes in our watercolor kits. Oop, focus down here. Okay, sorry, I was like, tell the camera what to do. Um, and we are gonna be working very dry, okay? So if we look at my palette, let me pull this over here. So we do not have like paint, we have a little bit of a paint puddle here that's too wet. So I'm gonna be using mostly this color and I have just like a tiny little puddle here that has some water. And this is probably even too much. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get that, my brush loaded up. So maybe I can let me back up a little bit just so you can see kind of my, my paint brush action. Let's kind of put this right here. It's like, I don't know, rearranging furniture. Okay, so you can kind of see that. You can see where my paper towel is. Okay, so we're, we're getting just the teeniest, tiniest bit. I am tapping my paintbrush on my paper towel to absorb any extra liquid, but it's, it's gonna keep the paint on there. And we are gonna dry brush this baby. So just real slow. I'm gonna start at the bottom. And this is where your patience and um, attention to detail is really gonna kick in. If you are like, F this S, you just paint your leaf, baby, okay? If this is not your jam, like, that's okay. Here, I'm gonna pull actually this um, second image up so you can really see, like, let's get in there, yes, okay. And then focus, focus here, focus here. Okay, are we good? Focus. Oh, I don't wanna record, no thanks. Okay, it is recording. Can you see that? I wanna focus here. Okay, there we go. So, sorry, sometimes you just have to talk to the technology, okay? So here we are going very, very slowly and building this up. Okay, the darkest edge is on this far point. And so as the paint kind of, as I notice my paintbrush is getting a little bit lower um, with the pigment, I can bring it out. You know how we've talked about feathering it out? When your brush has less pigment on it, that's a really great time to kind of bring that feathering technique out to start building layers, lighter layers. Okay, so again, if you were like, no, thanks, Kate, this is like so dang tedious, I am not here for this, then totally get it. <laughs> um, this is like my fave. Um, I love this kind of detail. I, I usually do like a little bit more button wet action. So I would probably do a couple layers, but I really want to get into this kind of dry brushing technique. So there is a pretty sharp line on the edge. So I'm okay having my brush flow here. But as we're building it up, it's still really, really dry. Okay. That's almost too much water. And I'm okay with it seeing, like as you do this, it should be so dry that you're seeing the texture of the paper, especially if you're using cold press. If you're using hot press, then I don't know, you might not see the texture of the paper so much, but you should see like a little, a little bit. Um, this is not full coverage. I think a lot of times when we're like painting, we think we have to cover the whole shape, okay? Let's switch it back to, what if this is a good layout? Is that good? So you can see kind of both. Um, let me know if you prefer like one or the other. Um, I think we think like you have to cover the whole area and really blend it and smooth it. But in these fine details, being able to see the brushy strokes is 
totally, totally fine. Um, I like a snappier brush for this kind of work because I find um, I just have a little bit more control over where um, where the brush is wiggling. Um, I like, <laughs> shocking, I like control. Um, let's see, we'll have a little bit of a shadow or like a darker spot over here. So we're just slowly, slowly building up this stem. Honestly, we could probably go on this stem for like an eternity. <laughs> Sounds like fun. It does sound like fun. Um, I'm a glutton for punishment, okay. So here is my, you can see my paintbrush is not as full with pigments. Now is a great time to kind of bring that gentle transition of color up the stem and you just keep building little tiny layers, like a little ant feeling it's making a big pile of something. I don't know, <laughs> that's a terrible metaphor. Like, um, you know, building a sand castle sand by sand grain by sand grain. Um, okay, so I can use when my paintbrush is like really wet, that's gonna be when we come into this edge that's a little bit sharper, a little bit darker. And I'm okay with that being like a smooth line. It's a really crisp line because it's the edge of our shape. So if you are interested in this type of art, um, I have an internet friend, Cheryl McCarthy, McCaffrey. I can't remember her name, um, her last name, but she does the most beautiful botanical artwork. Um, she's recently had her stuff in some really cool galleries. Um, and she's just a gem of a human and her attention to detail. She does a lot of this like found pieces she, um, she lives on the East Coast, and so she'll find all these beautiful things in her, you know, fall Massachusetts fall foliage situation and um, paints them, and it's, it's just a treasure to see her creation. So um, highly recommend. I'll be sure to link her in my, um, in my stories today, because um, we are channeling her baby, um, and I think that this technique can be really fun to use if you're like blowing up uh, an image, you know, like um, getting really, really uh, deep into like, oh gosh, there's some really cute images of like frogs inside dahlia petals. And I think that would be a really fun one to do, like very detailed. Okay, so see here, we're just building it up. I'm actually gonna add a little bit of green because we've got a little bit of green in this stem. Um, if you do any like macro photography, this could be a very cool um, technique to pair with your macro reference photos. I am like jonesing for a macro lens. So everybody tell Santa, you know. Okay, if you notice that your brush is like kind of spreading all over the place, you can always just dip it in water and kind of reshape it on your paper towel. Um, okay, so this just takes a lot of time, okay? Um, let's go ahead and we're gonna leave this stem because it's pretty much a lot more of this action. We're just gonna do kind of like microcosms within the, the section. So let's do... What do you think about, should we get into like this corner? I feel like, yeah, that one's kind of like down and dirty. So let's, let's get in there. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. So I'm trying to see how I can get all of this in the frame here without driving myself crazy. Okay. Um, so this is our leaf. We've got some pieces that aren't painted. So I'm actually going to leave those like totally. Um, I'm going to put some, uh, what is the word for this? Masking fluid on it. Um, but here's the question. Where's my masking pen? Okay. 
So we've used these before, but we're gonna use it again. And this is gonna make sure if you missed the masking fluid episode, definitely go check it out. It's a it's a trip. Um, but we are going to just mask over the parts that we don't want painted. So let's let's just go back to the overhead, I think. Um focus here. I'm making sure I don't have too much masking fluid on my little tool here and that I have a very, very fine point. Okay, so here we have like a little tiny divot. And we have like a little crack here. I almost think this masking fluid is like not thin enough if I'm being honest. But I think for now it's okay. I'm gonna put a little bit down here since we're since we're in it. We've got like a little. So if you're wanting an even finer point, you could probably go in like with the tip of a needle. Um and it's just gonna take a little bit more time, but you can definitely um get a really nice fine detail there. All right. Okay. Is that? There we go. And there's like a little bit. Down there. Okay. So that's good. I don't know if you can, can you see that a little bit? Um, okay. So I'm just gonna let that dry. It's easier to like take the goopy stuff off when we're, <laughs> when it's dry off the utensil. So, so let's actually, while that's drying, let's get into this part, the, like where the stem meets everything. So we're going to just set that right there. I think having our second angle is going to be helpful. Uh, let's do, let's do this layout and we'll just kind of, is that good? Okay, so we have some red under layer here. So I'm going to use a little bit of this dragon's blood. Y'all, this <laughs> Mary Blue dragon's blood is like such a fun color. It has a little bit more yellow in it. So I'm adding some of my transparent yellow. And I feel like we've got like a little bit of a burnt sienna action here, but I don't know where my burnt sienna is. So let's, nope, nope, here it is. So I'm gonna add some burnt sienna from May Mary Blue here, just somewhere on my <laughs> palette. I'm kind of running out of room, but you know, what are you gonna do? Okay. Just a little bit, just a little bit. Okay. So I've got a little bit of that. Yeah, just the ticket. Okay. And so we're gonna be creating this gentle shadow, uh, not shadow, but like layering. We're gonna go ahead and layer it like over the whole stem piece. And because it really does flow out from the center, I'm okay with this um, being a little bit more wet and wet. And we'll just kind of really make sure those edges are nice and dry and feathered out. Okay, so here we're gonna go all the way up we're just going to slowly start building our way out with this. Okay. Nice, gentle brush strokes. And this is going to get way darker. So right now we're just building this, this like orangey layer here. And we could get like so into the details of all these little veins. We don't have time for that today. But let me know in the comments if that's something like for maybe a... Um, like a course, you know, like a Skillshare kind of thing. If you'd like to really go into like, we go step by step and there's outlines and things like that. Um, if that would be something of interest, let me know. Um, I love painting like that, but I feel like it's not everyone's jam. So I would never want to put that upon anyone unless they're very enthusiastic about it. So here I'm just following the pattern of that color 
I'm using the stem line as a great opportunity to allow any dry lines to happen because we don't want to have any weird dry lines in this gentle gradation of our um, of our leaves. So if you're kind of working out some wet paint, see how I've left this line right here where the stem is? That's a really great place to kind of leave some of the paint moisture as you're working because you're going to cover over that with more paint later. All right, so let's keep adding. Um, oh, one color. Okay, so once again, I'm, I've got my color and I'm just gently dabbing it on the paper towel. I'm not like wiping, but um, I'm just tapping it onto the paper towel. Okay, and we're just slowly building. If you have any questions about any of this or anything, let me know. <laughs> um, I feel like my passion in watercolor is kind of a, a mixing of these, this technique and like the wet and wet and really allowing the watercolor to flow. Like I love creating kind of a wet and wild base layer and then going into the granularity like this at, um, at the final detail level. So I don't know that I would do this like on every part of a painting, like if I have a complex kind of composition. Um, I might save this maybe for like a detail, like um, if there's like a little bee on it or just the petals that are in focus or something like that. Um, are we doing on time? 9.30, perfect. Um, okay. So we keep building as I get my brush lighter. Um, like less pigment on it, that's a really great time to follow the trail of some of the veins. McCaffrey, Cheryl McCaffrey, that's her name. <laughs> cool. Um, I knew it would come to me. So once again, just building, building. And this is really soft, you know, this has that very delicate, like sweet, soft, um, like if you Google botanical illustrations, it almost looks like um, colored pencil in a way. Um, I just read The Botanist's Daughter. Um, I think I might've talked about it on these lives, but it's about this young woman and her father is a botanist and um, he goes around like, it's kind of in Victorian era, I think. And he goes around looking for exotic plants to bring back to England. And she um, paints them. She, and she kind of like tends the garden at home and she's a watercolor artist and um, she does these like beautiful renderings. So of course I'm like, ugh love it. Um, but she then, her, her father um, passes away early on in the book, and she is sent on a mission by him to find this very rare plant with these like powerful but dangerous medicinal properties. And there's a man out there who is also looking for this plant, and he is a dastardly villain. Um, and so we hear about her, and then we hear about um, like a more modern plot line of this young woman who is um, renovating her home and she finds this um, box with all these illustrations inside the um, walls of her home. And so we get to hear about the, um, the story of like how she discovers the origins of this and how it came to be in her home in Australia. Um, it's really good. Um, I enjoyed it so much. It had been a while since I'd 
like read a book that I actually enjoyed. So I feel like I've been kind of hitting some duds recently. Um, so highly recommend The Botanist's Daughter. All right. So we're just slowly waking, working our way out. The nice thing with this is, um, you know, when we're working with wet and wet, it's kind of like, okay, you have to hurry. You can't leave your seat until you're done with that section. Um, for this one, it's actually okay because you're working in really small sections and you can really build that up so if you are a person who has like little pockets of time here and there throughout the day i'm thinking like new moms sneaking painting between naps or just you don't know when you're going to have a second but you might just need a little zen time here and there rather than like sitting down and creating one piece in one sitting um this could be a really great way to kind of sneak in some watercolor meditation when you can. Um, I find this very calming because it's just slow, methodical work. Um, I'd be curious to hear in the comments. I know probably not all of you guys are like actively, um, you know, following with rapt attention. You'll probably kind of listen along as you're at work or something. But um, what do you think? Is this something that resonates with you? Or do you think you are maybe more of a quick and loose? Like, as we've been going through these, I know a lot of you guys have attended many sessions. Um, where where do you think your heart is taking you in your watercolor journey? And people in the comments, like um, watching later, let us know. Um, so we're just going up, up, up. I'm a little more of my burnt sienna and my dragon's blood. I will never say it normally. I'm sorry. It's just, you just have to say it with that vigor. <laughs> Usually I work my way from top to bottom. I don't know why I'm doing it from bottom to top, but we are working so small and so dry that I'm not too worried about digging my, excuse me, digging my hand through dragging my hands through my paintings here. And so usually I give a rule of thumb of like seven layers is kind of my sweet spot with my with my paper of knowing how many layers I can put on um, without aggravating the paper. Um, but I would say these, um, you get a little bit more um, leeway with this, um, because you are going so soft. Like, yes, I'm really rubbing this paper, but it's like, just like a little mouse kiss, like little mouse whiskers. Um, and so you are, you know, you're not stressing your paper out. You are, um, just slowly building up. So I think thinking about this in layers, um, I don't know that it's quite as concrete. Like you're just kind of building up and building up. And if you notice like the fibers of your paper maybe start to separate um, or are maybe not holding the paint as expected, you might be, you know, your paper might be telling you you're done before you feel like you're done. Um, that's okay. Um, you know, that's part of the beauty is like listening to your art supplies and allowing them to guide you in your art process. Um, but um, usually I feel like you can, you can have like a pretty long, like there's a good longevity in the paper and the layering when you're using this gentle technique. Okay. And I love how when you're using this kind of brushy technique, we are seeing the yellow from the under layer come through. We're seeing that depth and that darkness um, of the overlayer, but it's not giving us these really dark lines. Here I'm adding a little bit of water, a little bit more water to kind of just soften it a little bit in some of the spots. Um, earlier I was talking about making an outline of pencil and having it stick. Some people ask about like, well, what about, um, oh gosh, that's my coffee. Gross. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just put my paintbrush in my coffee. Um, 
uh, people ask about like, what about watercolor pencils? Um, and I have mixed feelings about those. So I think, you know, if you're curious about them, if you have some on hand, like try it. Um, I would say for me, the watercolor pencils I find put, so the way they work is they are filled with like watercolor. And so then once you've colored on it, you can add water. You Like you color on your paper, just like watercolor, um, or sorry, just like colored pencils but then you can add water to it and they're going to um, turn into watercolor and start flowing. So it'll um, kind of move across your page and all that. So I find, because I, I don't use them often, I find I don't have a good command of how much pigment I'm actually putting on the page. Like you can go, oh, excuse me, I'm gonna have to sneeze. <laughs> um, you can go really, um, light with those because it will get darker once you apply the water. And I find it's just a little too overpowering. And I think that's something that could be um, addressed with practice, right? But um, I just, I don't know. I, I like the control I have over the paintbrush. I feel like I don't have as much control over the colored pencil because it's not, you know, my medium but if you're coming from a colored pencil background it could be like a really great like a gateway hi l um it could be a really great rate blah, 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 blah. um great entry point for you in watercolor because it will feel like comfortable and familiar so um you know try it out um and those lines will um will not stay on your paper with the watercolor they but they will kind of bleed a little bit so if you're okay with that as you're painting over it, that's, you know, go for it. All right, so here, I'm just kind of working around the edge. Uh, oh, sorry, that's like not on camera at all. Um, really soft, really slowly. Oh my gosh, y'all, I'm like allergic to trees big time. And so this season will absolutely beautiful is giving me a huge case of the sneezy McGeezies. So pardon me. Okay. So I'm going to kind of work on this edge here and then we're going to start talking about some of those little spots. Okay. Um, so again, because it does have that kind of little crispy edge almost. Um, oh, cedar and oak trees are everywhere around here. The hill country in Texas will actually change colors if we're lucky. Um, oh, that's exciting. In Texas, do they just like fall off the tree green usually? Like just sizzle to a crisp? Like it's wild. Washington has really lovely um, falls. Um, but it, it's so different from, like it's, I feel like it's epic proportions compared to the East Coast, you know, like I, I was born in Connecticut and um, I lived in New York for a while and oh my gosh, East Coast, um, the falls are so beautiful. Um, and I would say like our kind of Washington, Oregon falls are, also really beautiful but in a different way because the trees are different right like we have a lot of um uh what am i trying to say evergreens so you get like this greenery this deep greenery peppered with um these fall leaf colors and it's oh man it's exquisite um okay so we're just kind of building this up. This is nowhere near done. Um, but let's go ahead and kind of talk about some of these little spots and how we're going to achieve that. So um, I'm trying to get my camera in a good spot for y'all. Let's, let's work on like, 
painting. Let's do that one right there. So where are you in my painting? I think you're about right there. So we're going to start with this red color. You can see it's a little bit browner, a little darker, but we're going to start with the red color because we're doing a little bit of a glaze. We're doing an undertone. So I am just gently, and we've got like some little friends over here too. It's like little, little freckles. Um, and then I'm going to be just softening that edge with my dry clean brush because it is so, um, you know, it's not like here's the circle around this dot, right? Like it is, um, kind of an unclear border. So I really like creating this under color here. And then we're going to add some, um, burnt umber crispy lawns right now. Oh my gosh, I bet. Um, so I was in Texas and so she's telling us about her crispy lawns for those of you who are on um, YouTube and can't seem her, see her comments. Um, I can't even imagine. My sister was in uh, Louisiana for a while and they've since moved, but just <laughs> calling her in February and she's like, oh yeah, we're, you know, out back in the baby pool or whatever. <laughs> I'm like, what is your life? Um, so we're just slowly building up that color. Let's see if I can get in any closer. Let me move this out of the way here. Um, I'm going to get it even darker. And I'm going to add in like a little bit of our, I love using indigo as kind of a way to deepen uh, browns. I think it's just a really um, like indigo and burnt umber, or burnt sienna are like a great way to kind of get close to black, but still have like a really nice warm color. So my dress is super dry. I'm kind of tapping it on my, um, what is that called? Paper towel. And now I'm basically just tapping this almost like stippling if you're, um, if you do like pen work, I'm just dot, 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 dot. Um, I feel like I have just the right amount on my brush that I'm gonna go ahead and add my little, my little crispy layer here to the edge. And this is not, I like this color, but it's actually not wet enough to get like a nice smooth line around the edge. So I'm adding just a smidge of water. I'm using my paper towel to kind of shape my brush into like a nice point. And we are gently adding that crisp layer. Little line here to the edge. Again, like when you want it to flow, you may need more water. Um, so for when you're trying to draw really smooth lines, you might need to add just a little bit of water to your brush. Like if you feel your paintbrush kind of dragging um, and it's stopping you from creating like a nice smooth line, you need more water. Okay, so here we're building that up. Um, and I'm liking where this is going, but as you can see, like it's been almost an hour. <laughs> we are not very far, right? Um, so if you have any questions before we, um, I'm gonna close off at 10, um, but if you have any questions specifically about other things on here, like let me know. I think these are some really great principles to get you started on painting your own realistic leaf. Um, and you'll encounter things and you'll be like, uh, wait, what? So let's get a little bit into the um, the stem here. We've got, whoop, we've got some darker spots. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and make, since my brush is really thin, you might want like a really tiny detail brush. Um, I'm really comfortable with this brush that I'm using right now. I'm very familiar with it. This is the brush we use in our kits. So it's like, um, it's what's handy, you know. Um, but here we've already added like this outline of the darker color. 
And so what I'm doing is I am then applying the um, more details on top here as we build up our stem. And truly, you could do more build up around here. Um, we're just kind of gently flowing into it like this. I'll probably do like a darker layer over this. Oh my gosh, y'all, I'm, I needed this relaxing today. Um, it's been a crazy week getting my tooth fixed tomorrow. Um, by the way, I don't know if I told y'all, but, um, today is the last day. If you want to go, if you've been wanting to get some kits, if you use the code tooth fairy in my shop, you'll get 15% off online. Um, so definitely check that out. <laughs> it's a good deal. Um, and I know like holidays are coming up and I've got a lot of bug markets. So if you have been wanting some kits, make sure you stock up early so you get, you get the ones you want. We do gift wrap too. Um, they'll come in, um, get this one a little closer. No. Um, for gift wrap, it comes in like a little um, craft paper sleeve and it's going to have some raffia wrapping around it and like a little um, little tag made out of seed paper so you can write like who it's to and from and we can write that too on the tag if you'd like. Um, so yeah. So we've got like some little um, kind of uh, shiny parts here. So I am painting like the outline of the vein. Um, and by not painting that part where it's shiny, I am um, giving that highlight. So we're painting around the highlight. If after you're done, you're like, ooh, I think I needed a little bit more. Like maybe you wish uh, it was white as the paper. You can always add um, bleed proof white. Um, see if I have that handy. I can show you what it looks like. It's also in my supply list, which um, is linked in like the link in my bio. But this is, sorry, this is the Bleed Proof White. And uh, Dr. PH Martins, I really like this brand. Little goes a long way. Make sure you put the lid on it, otherwise it gets gross. <laughs> Spoken from experience. So right now I'm really just working on the outline of this the, the vein structure. Um, and because we're working so light and so gently, um, you can do the outline here. I have a little bit more moisture on my brush, so I'm pulling and covering like a pretty large area, which is great. Um, because I know that whole color is going to be filled. I'm just slowly working my way up. And you'd, of course, like keep building and keep adding dark. So let's kind of just like maybe work on getting this part really nice and um, detailed. I think I almost want like a little bit more buildup of like the shadowy or not the shadow, but like this, this, uh, blending here. So I'm just adding another layer. I added a little bit of um, yellow ochre to give it a little bit more. Um, yellow ochre is an opaque paint and so I like how it's making it feel a little creamy. And here I am trying to fill in the little bumps and wiggles that we left from our first layer. Um, like from the paper, from the tooth of the paper. Um, this is pretty full coverage. As we move our way out, it'll get a little, we'll see a little more bump. But here we're just, we're feathering it out, getting a nice smooth transition. Got a little bit here, a little bump there. Okay, let's see.
We'll do that on the other side. Oh man, y'all are hanging in tight. <laughs> I feel like in my head, I don't know, I feel like this is so boring, but like, I don't know, I enjoy it. Um, I hope this is helpful. Um, my husband's like least favorite thing is like watching people like <laughs> work on something tedious. <laughs> like if I'm like, hey, can you come look at this canvas slide or something? And I'm like fussing with it. I think it makes his brain like want to explode. And so I'm like, oh God, this must be, I don't know, hard to, <laughs> hard to sit through, but maybe it's not. I don't know. Maybe it's calming. Maybe you're just here for the gabs. Okay, so we're really building up this part. Oh, there we can see it a little bit clearer. On the, okay, let's get a little bit more of this. Um, I'm getting my burnt umber. I've got my um, indigo. I'm adding a touch of this dragon's blood here to get like a little bit more of that red undertone. Mix up a nice, nearly black color. And we're going to get into some of that finer detail right in here. So we've got, it's like kind of one of the darkest parts. We're just going to follow that through where the little dark, dark lines are. Okay, you can tell I'm in the zone because I'm not talking as much. But yeah, I just, I really felt like I didn't know how much I needed this this morning. There's something, you know, I love like the quick dynamic tutorials because I feel like it's really great to like learn things fast and quick, but there's something so peaceful in the slowing down and the um, deep observation of doing this style of painting. And if you're looking up close, you'll see I kind of went out of the lines in some places and we're just going to be okay with it. <laughs> I could tidy them up afterwards or, you know, not care. I'm probably going to opt toward not caring. <laughs> <laughs> this is one very calming, hyper-focused moment. <laughs> oh, good. I, yeah, I'm definitely in the hyper-focused zone for sure. Um, I think I've talked about this before, but I find so I recently got an ADHD diagnosis. I'm sure none of you are shocked. Um, it's not that recently, like at the beginning of the year, but learning more about it, and I realize how much painting... Um, it's not just fun because it's creative. It's not just fun and calling to me because it's like, I don't know, um, artsy or colorful or whatever. I think my body like needs it because I can't relax. Like I literally, I don't know how. <laughs> um, I'm not good at it, which is okay. I keep trying, but like I, I have a really hard time like quieting my mind, quieting my body. And I think painting is one of the very few times that I am able to access that in a way that doesn't make me want to crawl out of my skin. Um, and that's so cool. And I, I didn't know that like consciously, you know, I'm like learning about this still, but I knew something about painting was just something that I needed deep in my soul. And um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, that's really why I want to share this. Like that's a big, um, motivation for me when I'm making the kits and stuff. Um, I know that executive function piece of like getting the supplies together for starting a crafting new crafting hobby or like researching what you need or getting all the pieces that can be really debilitating. Um, and hard to like get into, right? And 
I love that the kids kind of take that piece out of it. It takes the thinking, the decision making. I mean, you know, I have a couple moms in the in the audience right now, and you know, we're making decisions all day. If you have a demanding job, like you're making decisions all day, like adulting is hard, right? And I want to take the decisions out for you. So if you're like, you know, I think it's great to be like actively learning and trying to better your craft. And sometimes it's nice to just like color. So um, use the code tooth fairy in my shop. If you need a new coloring kit, <laughs> I got you boo boo because you deserve relaxation too. Um, some form of self care. All right. Oh, y'all. It's 10 a.m. I don't want to leave. I'm having so much fun. <laughs> um, but you can see I'm just gently, slowly building up the depth of this. I'm loving how this little wrinkle here came out. Let's see if I can zoom in up here on it. Is it? Uh, you see how nice that like little dot is turning out. So if you're looking at this and like, oh, this seems like a big endeavor, um, try a very small leaf. You know, you could even do some seeds or something. This can be a really great um, exercise in trying something new. Let me know in the comments how you like it. If you're like, never again. If you're like, now I'm obsessed. I will never do anything else um, for the eternity of time. I feel that. So, oh man, this is, I just wish I could paint all day. Thank you so, so much for joining me today, y'all. I adore painting with you. I adore being able to share this with you. It is truly a treasure. I am like really sad that this month is coming to an end because it's been so much fun to push ourselves creatively and all that jazz. Um, okay, I'm going to start crying. <laughs> I'm very emotional today. <laughs> but thank you for painting with me. I hope everyone has a beautiful day. Go take a walk outside. Look at the nature around you. Take some deep breaths and happy painting. Bye, y'all.